Want to be happy? Live a life, not just a business. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and this channel was created to help you overcome the number one challenge that is holding you back, a lack of belief in yourself. You watch these videos because you know you're capable of more. You have Michael Jordan level talent at something. So today, let's live your best belief life and get some of the best motivation from Oprah Winfrey. Enjoy. I always understood that there really was no difference between me and the audience. At times, I might have had better shoes, but at the core, yeah, the core of, of, of what really matters, that we are the same. Yeah. And you know how I know that? Because all of us are seeking the same thing. You're here at this fabulous school, and we'll go out into the world and each pursue based upon what you believe your talents are, what your skills are, maybe your gifts are, but you're seeking the same thing. Everybody wants to fulfill the highest, truest expression of yourself as a human being. That's what you're looking for. The highest, truest expression of yourself as a human being. And because I understand that, I understand that if you're working in a bakery and that's where you wanna be, and that may, be the, that may be what you've always wanted to do is to bake pies mm -hmm. for people or bake cakes for people or to offer your gift, then, then that's, that's for you. And there's no difference between you and me except that's, how, that's your platform, mm -hmm. that's your show every day. So my understanding of that has allowed me to, reach you know, everyone. to, to, to reach everyone. And, and there's no way that you wouldn't because that's, that's what I truly feel. The way through the challenge is to get still and ask yourself, what is the next right move? Not think about, oh, I got all of this stuff. What is the next right move? And then from that space, make the next right move and the next right move. And not to be overwhelmed by it because you know your life is bigger than that one moment. You know you're not defined by what somebody says is a failure for you because failure is just there to point you in a different direction. Nothing about my life is lucky. Nothing. A lot of grace, a lot of blessings, a lot of divine order, but I don't believe in luck. For me, luck is preparation meeting the moment of opportunity. There is no luck without you being prepared to handle that moment of opportunity. And so what I would say for myself is, is that because of my hand in a hand and a force greater than my own, I have been prepared in ways that I didn't even know I was being prepared for. And the truth is, for me and for every person, every single thing that has ever happened in your life is preparing you for the moment that is to come. You don't have to hold yourself hostage to who you used to be or anything you ever used to do. Because who has lived and hasn't made mistakes? When I think about my 20s and what a foolish girl I was and how I would give over my power to men who really didn't mean me well, but now I hold no grudges against them either because I realize I'm the one who gave over the power because I didn't know any better. And now that I know better, I know I don't have to do that again. It's one of the most powerful lessons any of us can ever know. If I leave you with nothing else, it, just know this for sure. There is not one thing that has ever happened to you. Not one experience not one encounter, not one crisis, not one joyful thing that hasn't happened just to make you better and help you rise. Every single thing you're calling in, whether you know it or not, and when you figure out that you are calling it in, when you actually start meditating or praying or doing or having a spiritual practice, which is the number one thing you need if you wanna be successful in the world. You need something that gives back and nourishes you regardless of what you call that. You need, to, you need to fill your cup so that you can be so full, your cup runneth over and you have enough to give to other people. If you don't fill your cup, you end up dried up. 
You end up tired, exhausted, and don't have enough to give to other people. You end up resentful every time somebody asks you because your cup is empty and now they want some of yours. <laughs> so your number one job, your number one job is to fill your cup and make yourself whole. Also, if you wanna have more confidence and learn from billionaires, check out my 254 series, they're free. The links to join are in the description below. They think that success is supposed to happen like that. that. It was very difficult for me to figure out where my boundaries were because I'd grown up poor and didn't have anything. And now that I know better, I know I don't have to do that again. It's one of the most powerful lessons any of us can ever know. I think in order to actually do the stuff, yes. money is important. But I also think the thing that I hold the dearest and the reason why uh, uh, the noise about running for president moved me so uh, hum humbly and deeply is because it means that you have somewhere in the work gain the people's trust. Yes, you have. And there is nothing more important to me than having the trust of the people and the audience. And I, I mean, I recognize yeah. that it is the audience who came every day and watched, you know, from all yeah, over all the around. world that actually, yes, that, that, that helped me to be who I am. So I think the- uh, the, the renown, the, the, the standing. The, the, the standing, yeah. the, the, the ability to be trusted and to say something, but also, my, listen, <laughs> Don't play the billionaire thing small. Don't play the be small. Yeah. It's 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 a very big deal because it allows <laughs> you to it allows you to it allows you to actually do the work. So instead of saying, gee, I would like to help so many people or you should go out and help so many people, you can actually use that for yourself. And I am now at this stage of my career thinking about how to do that more poignantly and fruitfully. Yeah. I'm now looking for ways that I can do that to uh, create a level of sustainability in, within our community. So for me, the foundational base of empowerment, of entrepreneurship, of any kind of engagement, the foundational base of my success, of my well-being, my wholeness, my everything is knowing who I am and where I come from. In my living room right now is a painting that I've owned now for 30 years. You can Google it. It's called To the Highest Bidder. And it's at the center of my house. And it's at the center of my house because it actually is symbolic of the foundation of not the house, but the foundation for my life. The painting is by Harry Roseland, who was a genre painter, painter in the uh, early 20th, late 19th century. And the painting is over six feet tall, and it, it shows a slave woman on the auction block holding her daughter's hand. And I cannot come in the door, my front door, or I cannot leave without passing that painting. I am reminded of where I come from every day of my life, and I am reminded because I never want to forget it. And in my library, I have a framed list of enslaved African-American people, remember I showed you, um, who were held in bondage on various plantations, listed in the ledgers alongside the cows and the horses and the buggies and the other property. And I pass this list every day. And often I stop in front of it and just speak their names out loud and their ages. Jonas, 11 years old, $500. Sarah, 41 years old, $900. Elizabeth, 57, $800. And I force myself to consider the absurdity and the obscenity of prices being affixed to each one should they be placed up for sale. And I sometimes just pause before them with a prayer, particularly before I have to make a big decision about one of my companies or whether I move forward or whether I stay still. It reminds me 
speaking those names out loud, not only of where I've come from, but how far I have to go because of them. And it reminds me that I am never alone. It reminds me of what I've come through to get through. Everybody is feeding yourself on the hysteria and the negativity. Talk you about gotta it. stay in the light. But one of the reasons why I was so excited is about A Wrinkle in Time, because the message is that the darkness is spreading so fast these days. You must become a warrior of the light. And the reason that's so meaningful to me is because that's how I've led my whole life. And every moment in that film, I just felt like, I'm just saying what I yeah. normally say. It's true. <laughs> and, I, and, and, and for these times, the darkness is there to show you your light. Look at what has happened. So if you put the focus on, look at what happened with the darkness that showed up in Parkland and the darkness that showed up on the streets of Ferguson and the darkness that showed up in many, 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 many homes in Chicago with shootings and uh, senseless murders. It brings out the best in people. It brings out the best. And so that's what it's there. We live on a planet where there is darkness and light. I deeply believe is not that do unto others as you would have them do unto you. What you do is already done. That moment in The Color Purple where she says, everything you ever tried to do to me, where, where Whoopi says that, Asili, everything you ever, everything you even try to do to me, already done to you. So the law, the third law of motion in physics says that what you're putting out is coming back all the time, regardless of whether you know it or acknowledge it or not. One of the things I tried to do all those years on The Oprah Show, sometimes people would criticize me because they felt that I didn't do enough for race or racism. But this is what I always understood, that for me, my role and my goal in life is to open, this, open people's hearts. That's what I do, is I, I try to tell stories that allow people to see themselves and the lives of other people. And for me, it was always more powerful and effective to do a show, for example, on single parents raising their children and just on the panel of parents to have a black father and to show the photographs or images of that father putting his child to bed and reading a story at night. That to me is more powerful than doing a story on let's talk about uh, fathers, black fathers who are raising their children. Because the goal for me is to show that we are all more alike than different and that in, in our humanity, in our ability to express our humanness, we are the same. So when you see a father putting his child to bed at night and reading stories and that man is black and you know that's what your husband does and that's what you do. You, you, you feel a sense of connection and humanity. Oh, you know what I'm saying? You see? Everything you try to do is already done. So when I figured that out, oh, what I'm putting out is what's coming back. Let me get real clear about what it is I'm putting out. Real clear. So... I read a book about 1989 called Seed of the Soul. And in that book, Gary Zukav talked about the laws of karma, of the laws of cause and effect, the third law of motion. And in that book, he talked about how intention, your intention is always one with the law, meaning before you even think about a thing, you have an intention for the thing. And that the intention is going to determine the outcome. That's why the same people can go to the same church service and somebody walk down the aisle just to be seen to put some money in the church. And somebody else who just goes and just has a little bit to offer. The intention with which you give, the intention with which you serve, determines the outcome. So when I figured that out, I went, whoa. I changed everything I did on my show. I called in the producers and I said, from this day forward, I will no longer be speaking to the KKK. I will no longer be speaking 
to people who are fighting each other in a way that it is damaging to the character of myself and other people who watch. From this day forward, I am only going to do intentional television. I say to the, my girls all of the time that your real work is to figure out where your power base is and to work on the alignment of your personality, your gifts that you have to give with the real reason why you're here. That's, that's the number one thing you have to do is to work on yourself and to fill yourself up and keep your cup full, keep yourself full. Now I used to be afraid of that. I used to be afraid, particularly from people who say, oh, she, she's so full of herself, mm, she's so full of herself. And now I embrace it. I, I, I consider it a compliment that I am full of myself. Because yeah. you only when you're full, I'm full, I'm overflowing, my cup runneth over. I have so much, I have so much to offer and so much to give. And I am not afraid of honoring myself, you know? It's miraculous when you think about it. My intention in creating Masterclass came from the understanding that everybody's story is the same, all stories are connected. And there is nothing that anyone who's living on earth has ever felt or known or experienced on a soul level that hasn't been felt or known or experienced by someone else. One of the most difficult things in life is feeling that you are the only one. You are the only one who's traveled this path, who's felt this way. I had nowhere to go. I was homeless at the time. I lost my family. Next thing I know, I'm in this car for three years, man. I'm struggling. Who's experienced such devastation or joy or triumph or victory. So for me, I define a master as someone who has fully stepped in and owned the full progress and trajectory of their life. Persistence pays off, that's lesson one. But hearing stories told from the mouths of people who know how to live, how to course correct, how to keep going, how to never quit, how to rejoice in the good times and have faith in the bad, those people are masters. Anyone who can do that is a master. And their ability to share their stories only helps the trajectory of others who listen. A lot of people don't know their purpose. And if you don't know your purpose, your immediate goal is to figure that out. Because otherwise you're just wandering around here. So the moment you can figure out what it is you're supposed to be doing, the sooner you are able to get about the business of doing that. My life is fueled by my being. Yep and the being fuels the doing. So I come from a centered place. I come from a focused place. I come from compassion. Um, it's, just, it's just my nature. I come from a willingness to understand and to be understood. Right. And I come from wanting to, to, to connect. I mean, the secret of that show for 25 years is that people could see themselves in me all over the world, they could see themselves in me. And even as I became uh, more and more uh, financially successful, which was a big surprise to me, I was like, oh my God, this is so exciting. Um, you mean you got more than that 30,000? I got more than 30,000 by the time I was 30. So, so my, so, but what, what I realized is through the whole process, because I'm grounded, in my own self, that although I could have more shoes, my feet stayed on the ground, although I was wearing better shoes. These are kind of cute today, too. Uh, so I could keep my feet on the ground even though I could get more shoes. And I could understand, I could understand that it really was because I was grounded. I've, I've done the, was doing and continue to this day to do the consciousness work I work at staying awake. Dear beautiful brown skinned girl. And I use the word beautiful because I know that's never a word you would call yourself. 
I look into your eyes and I see the light and hope of myself. In this photo, you're just about to turn 20, posing outside the television station where you were recently hired as a reporter. You look calm, you look happy, but I know how scared you are. If I could say anything to you, it would be, relax. It's gonna be okay, girl. The reason why I was number one for 25 years is because I figured out early on, there is no story anybody has ever heard that somebody else hasn't experienced. Nothing. And I also figured out, um, probably maybe the first or second year, that all pain is the same. That a mother in Somalia feels the same way as a mother in Seattle when she loses her child. And the common denominator in the human experience is our emotions and our feelings. And the more vulnerable and open you are willing to be with your story, the more actual understanding you create with other people and the more powerful you become. People don't think less of you for sharing your story. They think more of you for having the courage to share it. What would you say to your younger self? Oh, honey, honey, honey. Oh, baby girl. <laughs> what the world has in store for you. First of all, it would be relax. It would be stop being afraid. And it would be everything's going to be all right. No matter what, you're going to be okay. What inspired me was, um, and is, continues to be, what continues to inspire me, is a primal and fundamental desire to fulfill the highest expression of myself as a human being. I don't want to die not having completely burnt out every single possibility of my humanity. I just, I just want to, I, when, when I leave this planet, I want everybody to say, did that, used it all up, not another thing I could do. There wasn't another person I could have given of myself to, there wasn't another deed I could have done, sure. there wasn't anything, that you just want to, you want to say, I want to fill it up. You want to take this whole human existence, which when you think about it, Godfrey, is really pretty damn miraculous. It is. It is. It is. When you think about what it means to be a human being on the planet Earth right now, that's pretty awesome. So I just want to, I want, I want to, I want to take that to the max. Mm -hmm. I want to say, mm -hmm. no need to come back as a human. The day, first day I went to school, I was in a classroom. By the time I was, uh, you know, six years old. Didn't go to school till I was six years old because I was living with my grandmother at that time. Sure. But she had taught me how to read, read the Bible, Bible stories. So I went into the classroom knowing Nicodemus, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I could spell all of those words. I thought I was, you know, I was preaching to, the, to my kindergarten teacher. You were at the old <laughs> So <laughs> she was like, who is this girl? <laughs> so I was never placed in an environment mm -hmm. where I was ever made to feel inferior. I always felt like I'm the smartest kid in this room. And because I was never placed in a, in a, in a never put in a position where I was made to feel less than, sure. I didn't grow up feeling less than, you right. know? And the rest, as they say, is history. And because the rest, they say, is history. The... And it's all about what you believe. You know, yeah. I say this to, uh, when I, I do something on my network now called Life Class, the fundamental key to success is what you believe is true for yourself. Not what you want, not what you desire. It's what do you believe? You know, you can say, I want to, I want to be the most successful person in the world. Yeah. But if you believe that there's a glass ceiling and you're gonna have a hard time kicking through that glass ceiling, keep yourself you will down. be defined by the glass ceiling. Mm -hmm. And um, the great beauty and gift of my life is that I was never defined by the box that other people tried to put me in. Time, this was early on, you know, because when I first started making money and it was, you know, my salary or my earnings were published all over the place. I mean, the first year I was like, really? Did I make that much money? Oh my God. Um, it, it was very difficult for me to figure out where my boundaries were because I'd grown up poor and didn't have anything.
So it's easy when you don't have anything and people ask you for money. And they say, I need 500. You say, I don't have it because I'm just trying to get my rent paid. <laughs> it's harder when your multi-billion dollar salary is now in the paper and you get a lot of friends and cousins you didn't have before. So how do you set boundaries for yourself? I was having trouble setting boundaries myself for myself for even strangers. People would just show up at my door in Chicago and say, oh, bro, I left my husband. Please help me. And I would because she knows I have it. So don't try that now, though, okay? <laughs> don't try that now. I figured it out. So what I learned was is that Oh, the reason why people keep showing up is because my intention is to make them think that I'm such a nice person that you can ask me for anything, you can get me to do anything, I'm gonna say yes, I'm gonna say yes. So when Stevie called me this time, I thought I'd try out my first no on Stevie. Let's start big. He wanted me to donate some money to a charity and I didn't wanna to donate to the charity because I have my own charities, and I care about a lot of people, but the, the, the problem is when you, you have money, everybody thinks you just want to give to everything. So every letter I ever get starts with, we know you love the children. <laughs> yes, I do love the children, but somebody else is going to have to help the children. So I said to Stevie, uh, I said to Stevie, no. And... Um, as a person who has that disease to please, I was waiting for him then to, to say, I will never speak to you again. I will never call you. I will never sing a song for you. And he didn't. He just said, okay. Okay? Okay, it's okay? He said, okay, check you later. And what I learned from that is, Many times you will have angst and worry about things and put yourself in a state, like someone said this morning because their phone went off, they were mortified over a phone, I said, really? Um, you will put yourself in a state when the other person really isn't even thinking about you. So learning that I could specifically determine for myself what the boundaries were for me what I wanted to do, give my money, give my time, give of my service to who I wanted to give it to when I did, that I get to make that decision. And just because you get 100 requests a week doesn't mean you have to try to fulfill all of that. Just because you have all of these demands on your time and on you doesn't mean that you have to say yes. You get to decide because you're the master of your fate the captain of your soul, as William Ernest Henley said in Invictus. And understanding that really changed the meaning of my life in that I was not no longer driven by what other people wanted me to do, but took charge of my own destiny, making choices based upon what do I feel is the next right move for me. Turn your wounds into wisdom. You will be wounded many times in your life. You'll make mistakes. Some people will call them failures. But I have learned that failure is really God's way of saying, excuse me, you're moving in the wrong direction. It's just an experience. Just an experience. Just an experience. I remember being taken off the air in Baltimore being told that I was no longer be, being fit for television and that I could not anchor the news because I used to go out on the stories and my own truth was, even though I'm not a weeper, I would cry for the people in the stories and uh, which really wasn't very effective as a news reporter to be covering a fire <laughs> and uh, crying because the people lost their house. Um, and it wasn't until they, I was demoted as a on-air anchorwoman and thrown into the talk show arena to get rid of me that I allowed my own truth to come through. And the first day I was on the air doing my first talk show back in 1978, it felt like breathing, which is what your true passion should feel like. It should be so natural to you. 
And so I took what had been a mistake, what had been perceived as a failure with my career as an anchor woman in the news business and turned it into a talk show career that's done okay for me. I was interviewing a woman uh, on one of the shows. It was so impressive for me to see all the shows that we've done. Lord, it made me tired looking at it. Uh, but I was interviewing a woman. It was a show called The Mistress... The wives meet the mistresses or some crazy thing. And this woman was on and it was a live show. And in the middle of it, her husband tells the wife and our entire audience and the world that his mistress was pregnant. Yes. To this day, it makes my eyes water because I saw his wife's face. And I felt her humiliation. And I said, I will quit TV if I have to do this. I won't do this anymore. And my producer's like, what are we going to do? This is what everybody's doing. And then that same, during that same time period, so I said, I'm not going to do anything like that anymore. I'm not going to not going to bring people on TV. First of all, we didn't know that moment was going to happen. They were like, we didn't know it was going to happen. But that should not happen on television. And I do not want to be a part of the energy that caused somebody to feel that because that's not going to come back to me. I got to pay for that. Then I was interviewing the KKK on stage. That was the day the one guy called me a monkey in the audience. And during commercial break, I could see them signaling each other. And just watching them and their behavior, I thought, oh, they get it. I don't get it. They are using me. They're using this platform because they understand, because I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to tell you all about the KKK. They were using it to recruit members for themselves. They were using it to recruit their base. And I then went to the producers and said, I'm not doing a show like that. So they said, you're not going to do the mistresses. You're not, <laughs> you're not going to do the KKK. What are we going to do? So I said, we, we, we are going to um, create a baseline for ourselves that's based on intention. This was around 1989 when I'd read Gary Zukav's book called The Seat of the Soul. And that book was life-changing for me because in it he talked about the power of intention and that cause and effect, what goes out comes back, is determined by your intention. The energy of your intention is what determines your life. Most people don't think about their intention. They just think about what they want to do. Most people don't think about why they want to do it. But what's going to come back to you, the energy that's going to come back to you, is the real why of why you did it. And so I then said to my producers, we're not going to do any shows that are not intentional. So don't bring me an idea unless you have an intention for the show that you want the outcome to be. And we're gonna strive to see if we can live up to our intentions. And so around the late 80s, we started a pre-show to talk about what the intention was, and then a post-show after every single show to say, did we fulfill that intention? And that's about the time I realized this is bigger than me. I actually miss, I miss you guys. Yeah. I don't, I, I miss you guys. I miss, because where I got fed every day was the audience. Yeah. And I did not miss a day in 25 years because of the audience. Yeah. I don't care how badly I felt. I don't care what kind of cold, what kind of flu. I would come because I knew that our, you know, our, our, in our audience every day were a couple hundred, 350 people every day. Mm who have literally told their aunts, their cousins, they came with their mothers, yeah. they came with their friends. And I know that the preparation to get there, you've been coming from Iowa, you've been coming from Tennessee for days. Yeah. So it's not just a, oh, I'm just going to Oprah show. You tell that girl, I'm going mm -hmm. to Oprah I'm show. Oprah show. <laughs> and this is the thing. I think I have to just say, Please say, everybody is feeding yourself on the hysteria and the negativity. Talk you about gotta it. stay in the light. But one of the reasons why I was so excited is about A Wrinkle in Time, because the message is that the darkness is spreading so fast these days. You must become a warrior of the light. And the reason that's so meaningful to me is because that's how I've led my whole life.
And every moment in that film, I just felt like, I'm just saying what I yeah. normally say. It's true. <laughs> and, I, and, and, and for these times, the darkness is there to show you your light. Look at what has happened. So if you put the focus on, look at what happened with the darkness that showed up in Parkland and the darkness that showed up on the streets of Ferguson and the darkness that showed up in many, 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 many homes in Chicago with shootings and uh, senseless murders. It brings out the best in people. It brings out the best. And so that's what it's there. We live on a planet where there is darkness and light. I teach them that there is no life without cultivating a spiritual life because you are first and foremost a spiritual being having a human experience. And if you lose sight of that, it's easy to get lost in the world and no one can save a world that they're lost in when they've lost sight of their own North Star. So having a spiritual life actually means actively and ritually creating the space in your life all the time for gratitude, for kindness, for empathy, for inspiration, for joy, and for reverence for life in the home of your soul first. And then working to spread that inner joy outward. It means slowing down, it means taking in the moment, it means being exactly where you are, not distracted somewhere else. It means knowing who you are and getting about the business of fulfilling why you really came to our planet. What drives you to keep working so hard? You could, you know, you and I are in the 60s category. And so when you're in your 60s, you know you've lived more than you're going to live, yeah. realistically. So when you realize you've lived more than you're going to live, you can say, why not relax a little bit? Why not just ease up? Why have you decided to even work harder than you did before? Because I think, David, that everybody, you know, the thing that works for me all these years, whether it was the magazine, or which I still have, or whether it was the show, I, could, I understood that there's a common denominator in the human experience. And I want the same thing you want, which is the same thing you want and you want. What we all want is to be able to live out the truest, highest expression of ourselves as a human being. That doesn't end until you take your last breath. What is the truest, highest vision that you hold for yourself? No matter where you are in your life, there's always the next level. There's always the next level mm -hmm. to the last breath. So I feel that... I always knew that I would get, be done with the show when I felt like, oh, I've said as much as I could say here on this right. platform. And then how will I be used? If there, were, if there were a theme song to my life, Amazing Grace would be one of them, and Keep On Using Me Till You Use Me Up would be another one. Right, right. <laughs> You know that Bill Withers song? Yes. Da -da 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 -da. So I feel that until you have used your value as a human being, you're not done. Create the highest, grandest vision possible for your life because you become what you believe. When I was a little girl, Mississippi, growing up on the farm, only buckwheat is a role model, <laughs> watching my grandmother boil clothes in a big iron pot through the screen door because we didn't have a washing machine and made everything we had. I watched her and realized somehow inside myself and the spirit of myself that although this was segregated Mississippi and I was colored and female, that my life could be bigger, greater than what I saw. I remember being four or five years old, I certainly couldn't articulate it, but it was a feeling, and a feeling that I allowed myself to follow. I allowed myself to follow because if you were to ask me what is the secret to my success, it is because I understand that there is a power greater than myself that rules my life. And in life, in life, if you can be still long enough in, in all of your endeavors, in the good times, the hard times, to connect yourself to the source, I call it God, you can call it whatever you want, to the force, nature, Allah, the power. If you can connect yourself to the source and allow the energy that it is your personality, your life force to be connected to the greater force, anything is possible for you. I am proof of that. 
I think that my life, the fact that I was born where I was born and the time that I was and have been able to do what I've done speaks to the possibility, not that I am special, but that it could be done. What I learned, going to a beauty salon and asking them after the news director had told me that my hair was too thick and my eyes were too far apart and I needed a makeover, and um, sitting in a beauty salon, in a French beauty salon, allowing them to put a French perm on my black hair, <laughs> and having the perm burn th through my cerebral cortex, <laughs> and not being the woman that I am now, so not having the courage to say, this is burning me. <laughs> and coming out a week later bald and having to go on the air. <laughs> you learn a lot about yourself when you're black and a woman and bald and trying to be an anchor woman. <laughs> you, learn, you learn you're not Diana Ross and that you're not Barbara Walters trying to be, I was at the time. I had a lot of lessons. Uh, I remember going on the air many times and uh, not reading my copy ahead of time. And uh, I was on the air one night and ran across the word B-A-R-B-A-D-O-S. Um, that may be Barbados to you, but it was Barbados to me that night. <laughs> and telling the story as an anchor woman about a vote in Abstentia, California. I thought it was located near San Francisco. And one of the worst, one of the worst, this is when I broke out of my Barbara shell, because I'm sitting there crossing my legs, trying to talk like Barbara, be like Barbara. And uh, I was reading a story about someone with a blaze attitude, which... <laughs> if I had gone to Wellesley, I would have known it was blasé. <laughs> and I started to laugh at myself on the air and broke through my Barbara shell and had decided on that day that laughing was okay, even though Barbara hadn't at that time. <laughs> um, and it was through my series of mistakes that I learned that I could be a better Oprah than I could be a better Barbara, and I allowed Barbara to be the mentor for me, as she always has been. And I decided then to try to pursue the idea of being myself, and I am just thrilled that I get paid so much every day for just, <laughs> just being myself. But it was a lesson long in coming recognizing that I had the instinct, that the inner voice that told me that you need to try to find a way to answer to your own truth was the voice I needed to be still and listen to. Get this, this is just remember this, because this will happen many times in your life. When people show you who they are, believe them the first time. Not the 29th time. That's particularly good when it comes to, to, to men situations, because when he doesn't call back the first time, when you're mistreated the first time, when you see someone who shows you a lack of integrity or dishonesty the first time, know that that will be followed by many, many, many other times that will, at some point in life, come back to haunt or hurt you. When people show you who they are, believe them the first time. Live your life from a point of view of truth and you will... Live your life from truth and you will survive everything. Everything. I believe even death. You will survive everything if you can live your life from a point of view of truth. Close your eyes for a moment, will you please? And breathe with me. Just close your eyes. And if you will, put your thumb to your middle finger and gather your other fingers around and let's feel the vibration and pulse of your personal energy as you take three deep breaths with me. Inhale. And as you exhale, just feel the vibration, energy, blood pulsating through your body through you. And another inhale. <sighs> and
and another inhale. And keep your eyes closed. And let's just think about this day. This day that you have been graced to breathe in and out thousands of times. This day where many of those breaths were taken for granted. You just expected the next one to come. But the truth is there's no guarantee that the next one comes. This day, how you started your day, what your thoughts were this morning, how you've carried yourself through this day, how you've been allowed to have encounters and experiences, some challenging, some more life enhancing, that pushed you forward another day of being here on the planet Earth as a human being. Let's just think about that. After all you've been through, in this day alone, and the many days and years past, how you got here to this prestigious, esteemed university, the choices you made that have brought you to this day. Open your heart and quietly to yourself. Say the only prayer that's ever needed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're still here. And you get another chance this day to do better and be better. Another chance to become more of who you were created and what you were created to fulfill. Thank you. And the number one lesson I could offer you where your work is concerned is this. Become so skilled, so vigilant, so flat out fantastic at what you do, that your talent cannot be dismissed. You stop comparing yourself to other people. You're only on this planet to be you, not someone else's imitation of you. I had to learn that the hard way on the air live, anchoring the news. One night in my 20s, when I first started broadcasting, I was 19, moved to an anchor by the time I was 20, and I was just pretending to be Barbara Walker, Walters. I was just trying to talk like Barbara, act like Barbara, Barbara hold my legs like Barbara. Um, and I was on the air, and I hadn't read the copy fully, and I called Canada, Canada. And <laughs> I did that on the air. I cracked myself up because I thought Barbara would never call Canada, Canada. <laughs> And that little breakthrough, that little crack, that little moment that I stopped pretending allowed the real me to come through. Your life journey is about learning to become more of who you are and fulfilling the highest, truest expression of yourself as a human being. You are responsible for your life. And if you're sitting around waiting on somebody to save you, to fix you, to even help you, you are wasting your time because only you have the power to take responsibility to move your life forward. And the sooner you get that, the sooner your life gets into gear. What matters is now, this moment, and your willingness to see this moment 
for what it is, accept it, forgive the past, take responsibility, and move forward. Actually, I did this at the end of my uh, sh uh, show. I did my favorite guest of all times. That's hard to do out of literally th thousands and thousands. They, they, they supposedly estimated lines. that there's like 35,000 people I interviewed over the years. But there was one woman out of all the celebrities, out of all of the famous, non-famous, infamous people. One woman who from Zim she? Who was she? Her name is Terai Trent. Listen to the story. I'm gonna try to shorten it for you, Please Godfrey. Do. Okay. Terai Trent, born and raised in a village in Zimbabwe. 11 years old, she's doing her brother's homework. She wants to go to school. Her father says, no, you're a girl. You have, to, you have to educate the boy first. Yep, that's right. That was the I, tradition. That's right. The boy has to go to school. You can't go to school. So she starts doing her brother's homework. She does his brother's homework. He goes to school. He gets all A's on his homework, yet he doesn't know the answer to the question. The teacher comes to the village to say, what is going on here? This boy doesn't know the answers, but his homework's perfect. She finds out that Terai, his younger sister, is doing his homework. She begs the father to let Terai go to school. The father says, no, she can't go to school. Finally, he marries her off. She marries at 11 and a half years old. She gets married. She has three children by the time she's 18 years old. A woman comes to the village from an NGO, Heifer International, and asks, what are your dreams? This is gonna make me cry. Finally, you're gonna make me cry. <laughs> asks it. her, what are your dreams? This child has never thought about what her dreams were. She says, write down your dreams. She writes down her dreams on a piece of paper and she folds them in a tin can and she buries them under a rock. The oh, first dream yes. was to be able to go to, the school in, go to a school in the United States of America and get a college degree. She ends up, through some miracle of the NGO, going to the United States. She wow. gets a college degree. Wow. Yes, she gets a four-year degree in three years. Uh. Terrorite Trent. She goes back to the rock in Zimbabwe. She writes her next goal on the piece of paper. She buries it under the rock. She writes, I want to get a master's degree. She goes back to the United States. She gets a master's degree. By this time, she now has five children. She's married to a man who still oh, beats incredible. her. Incredible. Incredible. She goes back to the United States. She gets her master's degree. After the master's degree, she goes back to the rock in Zimbabwe. She writes down her final goal is to get a doctorate degree. And last year, she became Dr. Tarai Trent. Where did you find it? Where did I find it? Um, I found her in the, in the Nicholas Kristof's book called uh, something, the sky, underneath the sky or the sky. I, I, Nicola, I found her in Nicholas Kristof's book. Incredible, mm -hmm. incredible. And I was reading the story. I had Nicholas Kristof on the show. Nicholas Kristof, the famous New York Times writer. And she wasn't there. She wasn't a part of the show. I'm reading the story. I can't believe this book, the story of this woman as I'm reading the story. So when we go to do the show, the producers have Nicholas Kristof on. They bring on other guests, but this woman isn't there. I go, how, how could you not have her there? So we tape another show with Nicholas Kristoff. We go back, I go, fine, we're gonna find that woman, Tara Wright Trent. This time, by this time, she's living in the United States. We followed her back to Zimbabwe, to the rock. We pulled the tin can from underneath the rock. And that is my favorite guest of all time. And the worst? Um, I don't have a worst. I don't have a worse. But the reason why she, and, and as I said this on my show, the reason why Tara Rai Trent is my favorite guest of all time is because she represents in that one story of the little girl in a village in Zimbabwe who had a dream and the heart and depth and discipline to pursue it. She represents everything I tried to say in every show in 25 years. She literally, through her life story, sums up the message that I was trying to give to every single one of my viewers. You can, you can, keep trying, don't give up. The universe speaks to us always, first in whispers. And a whisper usually in your life feels like, hmm, that's odd, or hmm, that doesn't make any sense. Or, hmm, is that right? It just really feels like that. It's, that. it's that kind of subtle. And if you don't pay attention to the whisper, 
It gets louder and louder and louder. And I say, it's like getting thumped upside the head. You don't pay attention to that. It's like getting a brick upside your head. You don't pay attention to that. The brick wall falls down. That is the pattern that I see in my life and so many other people's lives. And so I ask people, what are the whispers? What's whispering to you now? I have paid attention to my life because I understand that my life, just like your life, is always speaking to you, where you are, in the language, with the people, with the circumstances and experiences that you can understand and interpret if you are willing to see that always life, God, is speaking to you. Now, it took me a while to actually really get this and to understand it, but once I did, I started paying attention to everything. And one of the reasons why I can now accept the fact that I can offer my gatherings of information and wisdom and call myself a spiritual teacher is that every single person who ever came on my show, and I hear there's like 37,000 guests I've talked to, a lot of them came from dysfunction and a lot of them wouldn't appear to be teachers, but every one of them had something to say that was meaningful and valuable and that I could use to grow myself into the best of myself, which is what all of our jobs are. Your number one job is to become more of yourself and to grow yourself into the best of yourself. If you can find what is your passion, if you find what you love, you never get tired. Or if you do get tired, if you, you're fueled by the energy of your work. And you know what you're supposed to do by how it, how it feels. And so you know if you're doing the right thing, if it feels like it's right to you. And when you hit the thing that feels right, you know it's right because it gives you your juice. And you know it's right because you would do it for nothing. You would do it for nothing and find a way to be able just to do it in order to be able to continue. That's how you know you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. It is your job to make yourself whole. Not perfect, but whole and full. Your real work in life, your real work, is to fill yourself till your cup runneth over so that you're never grasping and needy clamoring and insecure, but that you can live your life assured in your worthiness and your right to be here and to become the best version of yourself as a woman being. You came from very modest circumstances. You didn't come from a wealthy family. Well, modest is not the word. Well, I was trying to be polite. I, I mean, I was, I was actually poor. And I, you know, a lot of the girls at my school, actually all the girls from my school are poor. And I was saying to them just recently, I was just in South Africa for a graduation, you know, you all are come, come from the same circumstances, you were poor. And one of the girls raised her hand and said, I don't like using that word. I go, well, if you're not poor, then you should excuse yourself because that's why I'm paying for right. you because you're in your <laughs> school. So if you're not poor, you don't like the choice of the word. So I don't, I don't have a problem with the word. I don't have any shame about it. I think. You know, probably earlier in my life or career, the word would have bothered me. But it truly, it was, it, it, it was, I was poor. No running water, David, or electricity, wow. living with an outhouse. My biggest frustration is not just with young women. My biggest frustration is also with young men, young people who think that, and I have a lot of this with my girls in college, they think that success is supposed to happen like that. that. Yeah. They think yes. that there isn't a process to it. They think that they're supposed to come out of college and have their brand. And um, I recognize now that I am a brand, but I was resistant to being called a brand for many years because I was like, I'm a brand, I'm not a brand, I'm, I'm a person. But how I got to be a brand was not trying to be a brand. Yes. How I got to be a brand was every day making choices that felt like this is the right move, and now that's the right move, and now that's the next right move, the next right move. And so my frustration with young women and young men yes. is that they think it's supposed to happen 
like this, and they don't understand that there's a process to it. Social media. Yes, yeah, social media. <laughs> you did not get to be editor of Vogue magazine by not working and working and working yes. and working and working to get here. I love the theory of that there's 10,000 hours behind anybody who ever gets to be successful. Who are your dream dinner companions, dead or alive? Oh my gosh. I would like Jesus to come to dinner and explain. Explain. <laughs> Is this what you wanted? Is this really what you wanted? Did you want the churches and the people and the... Did you, did you want all yes. that? Or were you looking for people to have a different level of consciousness? Did you want the Christ consciousness? Because I think a lot of people got it wrong, Jesus. If you went opera, what would you be doing with your life? I would definitely, definitely, definitely be teaching in a classroom. Yes. Because it's the thing that still brings me the greatest joy. Mm -hmm. um, I now teach by satellite to my uh, girls in, in, in school in South Africa. And it is my favorite moment in the world when you can see someone get it. Okay, I know this is a short thing, but the other day I was teaching an eighth grade class. And I was using my favorite quote from Maya Angelou, where she says, I come as one but I stand as 10,000. Wow, that's a great one. Isn't it a great one? It's a great one. And I was saying to the girls, because sometimes they say, sometimes, you know, I feel so alone, I miss my parents, I miss, because it's a boarding school. I say, every time I walk into a room, girls, I feel like my Angelou said when she said, I come as one, I stand as 10,000. What does that mean? Close your eyes and think of your parents. Think of your mother and your father. Now think of their mother and their father. Now think of their mother and their father. And I did that for like a minute mm. till the girl started giggling. I go, that's your 10,000. Yes. So when you walk into a room, you never walk alone. Incredible. You walk with the 10,000 who've come before mm. you and are with you and are constantly surrounding you. And I could see them get it. Yeah which is just fantastic when the light goes on and you realize, oh, they got it. The beauty of my life, Edward, is that from, I'd say, 32, 33 on, I figured out how to be myself completely on television. And all these years, I have made a fortune, really, being myself. So I'm never not me. I'm never not the person that you see. You know, there are days when I am more open and warm than others. And one of the things that actually caused me in 1991 to get my own plane, I was in the airport and I was just minding my own business. And a woman came up and she said, you're not acting like you do on TV. Oh. And I said, What's that? She says, well, on TV, you're hugging everybody and you're just sitting here and you're not hugging away. I'm just sitting here, ma'am, I'm just waiting on the plane. So um, if I'm in an airport, I'm not necessarily walking around hugging people, okay? But I am, I am just always just myself. Life has dreamed a dream for you. And your, your goal, your number one job is to figure out what that dream is. And align yourself with the dream because the dream cannot come to you unless you're willing to meet it energetically in the same place. So if your energy is off, which I say to my girls all the time, they could teach this class right now, on being in flow. If you are not in flow with God's dream for you, with life's dream for you, if you are out of order, if you are out of sync, it cannot come to you. It will not come because the whole purpose of your life is to line yourself up with the purpose. And so if you are operating in fear, if you are operating in uh, jealousy, je jealousy will kill you. When you are synced up with life, life just gives to you. It opens doors, it creates experiences, it allows you to meet people, things show up you never thought were gonna show up, and you are doing what is the purpose of your soul being. I started the magazine. They said, you will not see a profit for at least the next five years, and we were profitable the first month, the second month, and, and, and have been since. And so I thought, oh, okay, those predictions, that is not really that true. I had no idea how difficult it would be. 
However, I am really, um, there's an old uh, spiritual that says, wouldn't take nothing from a journey now. I, I really was speaking to Stephen this morning. He was saying, it's a good thing that you went through that because you were living on the mountaintop for the past 25 years. You created this machine of the Oprah show that it just felt like walking into, okay, here we go. So no struggle, no, just it, it had become easy for me to do. So to be in a position to build from scratch this network and to go through everybody thinking it was going to fail. And there were days when I had doubts myself, like, I had to force myself to actually practice what I had preached for years about going inside, staying with the vision, taking, having every step move you in the direction of the vision and trusting, trusting that, building the right team. It was difficult for some days. One of the things I started to get uh, around mid to late, no, no, late, mid to late 90s, is that everybody that I had on the show, at the end of the show, would say something to me like, um, was that okay? Was that okay? How was that? Was that okay? Right. At the end of the interview. And I started to then track it. It didn't matter if it was, um, I, 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 I had gone and done a show where I was in um, a prison, and I was interviewing a father who was in jail for life for murdering his twin daughters. And at the end of the interview, even behind bars, he said to me, is that okay? How'd I do? And Barack Obama said it when he sat in the chair the first time. And George Bush said it. Beyonce said it at the end of her. She taught me how to twerk and then said, is that okay? Right, right, right. <laughs> so that's an acquired skill, do you think? Right? Yes, the <laughs> twerking thing. But this is what I learned uh, sitting in that chair for 25 years. That at the end of the day, whether you are interviewing me or I get to interview you, whatever your profession is, wherever you are in your life, in your relationships, every person that you encounter, every experience, the person wants to know, was that okay? Was that okay? And what I started to hear was that what people are really saying is, did you hear me? Did you hear me? And did what I say mean anything right. to you? And so I started to listen with that in mind, with that intention of validating that your being here, your speaking to me, your taking the time to do this with me is important because you matter. And that's true for everybody who's watching or listening, that every argument that you ever have, every encounter, the person just wants to know, did you hear me? Did you see me? And did I say anything that mattered? Everybody has a different talent. And the reason we're all so messed up is because you're looking at everybody else's yeah. talent yeah. and wishing you had some of their talent. All the energy that you spend thinking about, wishing about, being jealous of, envious of anybody else is energy that you're not only putting out that's gonna come back to you negatively, but you're taking that away from you. All your energy should be forced on what do I have to offer? What do I have to give? How can I be used in service? Because Dr. King's message of not everybody can be famous, but everybody can be great because greatness is determined by service. And there is not a job in here that you can do that you don't switch the paradigm to service and not make that job more fulfilling. I don't care what the job is. If you say, I'm a singer, I'm a dancer, I'm an artist, I'm a teacher, I'm a nurse, I'm a doctor, I'm a janitor, I'm a, I'm a clerk, I'm a, if you say, if I look at this from, how do I use this in service to something bigger than myself? Yes. It no longer becomes a job. It becomes an offering to the world. This is the beauty of, of my life. There's not a thing that happens to me that I don't look at it as a teaching, learning experience. And so whenever I'm going into any kind of crisis, I've said this many times before, I'm always looking for what is this here to teach me. Reading is the strongest signal for success in the future that I've ever seen. It is the strongest, strongest, strongest. I got my first job in radio uh, when I was 16 years old, because so, I've been, been broadcasting since I was 16 years old. But my first job I got because I was a great reader. When you are a great reader, you can articulate and speak 
and command the English language in ways that other people cannot. And people think you're a lot smarter than you are, <laughs> lots of times. Have you ever met a person for. who was a great reader when they were young who was not successful? You never, never. It is the absolute best foundation ever in life. The first law is the third law of motion in physics, which says for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And we showed that very beautifully in The Color Purple, when Miss Seeley says to Mr. Everything you even try to do to me is already done to you. That is not just a, a rhetorical saying, that is law. That is Newton's third law of motion in physics, which says everything that goes out is coming back. Mm. It's just like everything that goes up is coming down, may take it a long time to come down, is coming down. <laughs> everything that goes out is coming back, it's coming back. So to answer the power of manifestation and meditation, what meditation does is sync you up with the source. What meditation does is allows you to literally tap into the power that created you so that you are in alignment with that. And so when you carry that out into the world, everything that you do comes from the center of that alignment that's coming from the source that we call God, we call divine energy, divine intelligence, whatever name you want to give it to, we call life. When you are synced up with life, life just gives to you. So when I first started making money, I was one of those people who felt, oh, I got to, every time somebody asks me, I got to, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So you go crazy. I, you go crazy. You have to look within yourself. What do you want to do? That, that, that means family members, because you get a lot of cousins. <laughs> cousins, cousins you, you didn't know you, you know, had. Wait a minute. When you get the Van Jones show, all of a sudden you get cousins <laughs> following you. So you decide for yourself. Yeah. And so I have, uh, you know, I've given away so much yes. that people don't know because most of the time you yeah. don't hear yeah. about the and you, people and, and that I've helped. So yeah. people complain about what I did or didn't do. Mm -hmm. Y'all don't know me. Don't know me. You, <laughs> you don't know me. I do. Yeah. I do. And and, and, and God, God does. So I don't have any. Let me get, let me get one more. I have all of that very much in check. Guys, in your personal intention. So it is my intention, my intention to fulfill the dream of the creator. It is my intention to live to the highest calling and be pressed to the mark of the highest calling that I have come to do. And when you can ask the creator, ask that which made you you, what is your dream for me? I guarantee you, instead of you trying to define the dream, what is your dream for me? If you're able to lean into the dream that the universe and all the forces of, 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 of light and love and power and grace by all the names that we call God has for you, nobody can touch you. Nobody can touch you. That show was on for 25 years yeah. in Chicago, and um, when you did it, you won, I think, almost 50 Emmy Awards, and it was voted one of the best TV shows in the history of TV. So you ended it, though, after 25 years to do other things, and we'll talk about that, but you, no regrets about ending that show. No, no, reg no regrets whatsoever. You know, I, I didn't want to be punch drunk in the ring, still trying to uh, come up with what is the next thing, what is the next thing, because over the years, we became our own greatest competition. So when I first started, uh, went national in 1986. Every time there'd be another talk show, I'd be, oh, Geraldo Rivera, oh, what are we going to do? And then I realized a couple of years in that you run your own race better than anybody. If you take the time to see what everybody else is doing, you lose your ground. And that I could be a better me than I could be anybody else. And so no need of trying to compare myself to other people. Oh, your own value. Absolutely. Okay. So when you're saying, I know who I am, and, and I'm telling you, it's the thread that runs through everything. It's the thing that allows you to stand in your own truth. And one of the things for years that Maya Angelou used to say to me is, baby, you need to know that you alone are enough. You alone are enough. Every single day, I would have a pre-show meeting and have the producers come in and state to me, what is your intention? 
How do we want to use whoever is on this show, whatever is happening on this show, to serve the audience in a way that fulfills the mission of uplifting, enlightening, encouraging, as well as entertaining? And if it doesn't do that, then I can't do it. I figured this out early on in the show. I had read this quote from uh, Dr. King, uh, one of my favorite quotes from him that says, not everybody can be famous, but everybody could be great because greatness is determined by service. And I literally shifted, I used that quote to help me shift the way I saw the platform of television instead of like, oh, I'm, I'm on TV. How do I use that platform as a, as a platform of service is, Amen. Is, is what I did. Yeah. Yeah, we know. And you did that pretty well, too. <laughs> but when you think about growing and being empowered yourself, it is what you've been able to do for other people that, that leaves yes. you the fullest. Yes, that absolutely. There's a bigger dream waiting for you, just waiting for you to step into it, to step into it. Your life is big, your life is huge, and we spend so much time wanting to be in somebody else's life. And you don't get honored, you don't get revered, you don't get celebrating wanting what somebody else has Because that which created you, divine intelligence that dreamed you from before your ancestors ever knew they would become your ancestors, that which dreamed the seed of you wants you to know how special, how wondrous, how mysterious, how complex, how glorious, how phenomenal you are. And you get no credit messing in somebody else's territory. Or trying to have power over something you have no control. Another one of my favorite teachings is the Wizard of Oz. When the witch, Wicked Witch of the West says, go away from here because you don't have any power here, you have no power in any territory other than your own. Oh, but you are the master of that. You get to be the master of your own fate. You get to be the captain of your own soul. And if you just manage that, if you just took care of your territory, oh, the glorious, 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 wondrous, wondrous opportunities and possibilities that are waiting for you. So the question is, what are you resisting? What are you pushing against? What are you not allowing? What are you blocking? Because you have this idea of who and what you're supposed to be instead of leaning into the dream that's already been created and waiting for you. It's waiting for you. And the second, I mean, it doesn't, it's an instant thing. It's a shift in the way you see yourself and the power from which you have come. I started feeling like, I think everybody knows, I, I've, I, I've moved my whole life on instinct, you know? I feel like now it's time to let the show go. I feel like it's time to move on because I've grown as much as I can grow. When I've grown as much as right. I can grow in a space, that's my instinct to move. I went through some tough times after, after I left the Oprah show. I made a conscious decision that I did not want to be sitting on TV with the Oprah show and y'all saying, she should have left that show. <laughs> that show was really good two years ago. I made a conscious decision, decision that when I felt I had said all that I could say and the audience had heard it, that I would move on and that I would not spend my life regretting or trying to hold on to what used to be or hold on to what I had. So I dreamed this dream of starting a network. And in the beginning, it was, it was a struggle. It was a struggle because I didn't, I, honest to goodness, I did not know what I was doing. 
I was trying to figure it out. I was trying to figure it out. I thought that the Oprah Show audience would follow us to own, and then I realized y'all didn't have cable. And if you had cable, you did not have the own package. So, so it took me a minute. And unlike most people who you get to have your mistakes in private, some don't go right in your life, you get to sulk about it in private. If I make a mistake, it's on the CNN crawl or the CNN news. So when I was in the climb and there were so many wonderful owners, I see Churl Action Jackson here. There were so many wonderful owners, people who said, oh, we're going to stand with you. We're going to stand by you. Thank you, Roland Martin. There were so many people who said, listen, we believe that this can happen. So I dreamed the dream along with Tyler Perry, who was my friend who came to me and said, Tyler, Tyler said, I'm going to help you out because Tyler can go home and write a script and direct it, produce it, and shoot it, and do it for less money than anybody in Hollywood. So we started with the foundation of have and have nots. If loving you is wrong, love thy neighbor, Mama Hattie. And then I started to dream another dream about scripted television, because in the beginning I was told you couldn't do it. You couldn't do it, didn't have enough money to do it. And I dreamed the dream. I read Proverbs 11:28 that says, those who trust in their riches will fall, but the righteous will rise and thrive like a green leaf. You can't get what you want by focusing on what you don't want. This is about the need to establish as many meaningful connections as we can. If we're going to save the world, we have to find a way to connect to each other, to connect to the nature that we're killing, to animals, to history, to an acknowledgement of the lingering trauma of racism and sexism. We need to connect to the people we love and mean something to us, and more than that, to the people who don't. That doesn't mean we always have to agree with another person's philosophy. It means we, if we're going to continue to survive and thrive on this planet, have to find ways to transcend the politics of division and embrace the places that bond us where we find our human ground. And everybody has their own dreams. There is, there was a time where I used to spend a lot of energy wanting things, wanting things. Of course, it's easy for me to say, oh, things don't define you because I got a lot of things. Things are nice, I like them. But this is what I learned. When you can surrender to the dream, you get to live in the space of the higher power. You get to live in the space that you purposefully have come to earth to claim for yourself. So, around 1984, I was sitting in bed one morning, uh, Sunday morning, should have been in church, but I wasn't. I was reading the New York Times review of The Color Purple. And I thought, whoa, this sounds like a really great book. I got out of bed in my pajamas, put on my galoshes, and went to the store to get the copy of The Color Purple. I read The Color Purple in one afternoon, got, went back to the bookstore, bought every book of The Color Purple. I took the books to, to the office and I said to everybody, y'all gotta read this book. Oh my God, you gotta read this book, Color Purple. I needed a book club, I didn't have one. Uh, so I passed out the book to everybody I knew. Please, read The Color Purple, read The Color Purple. Then I start to hear that somebody's gonna do a movie about The Color Purple. But I don't know anybody in the movie business. By this time, I was on AM Chicago. I don't know anybody. I start praying to God. God, please help me find a way to get into color purple. I say, Jesus, I don't even have to have a speaking part. I will be, because I went to the movies and I saw on the movie credits, at the last credit, there's something called Best Boy. So I said, Jesus, if you just let me be best girl, That'd be all right by me. I can be best girl. 
I can carry the script. I can help the people with the water. I can do whatever. So I start praying for the color purple. As, as divine law would have it, Quincy Jones comes to Chicago and he is in Chicago for one half of a day because somebody has filed a suit against Michael Jackson claiming that Billie Jean was their lover and that's not his song. <laughs> so Quincy had taken the red eye to Chicago. He was in his hotel room. He was coming out of the shower and the television in his hotel room is on AM Chicago. There sits little chubby me with my Jerry curl <laughs> on AM Chicago. Quincy Jones tells Reuben Cannon, the casting agent, I think I found Sophia. So I get a call from Reuben Cannon who says, I'm calling about a movie. It's called Moon Song. Would you be interested to come and audition? And I say, I have not been praying for Moon Song. <laughs> no. I have not been playing for Moon Song. I've been praying for the color purple. He said, Well, I think you should come and, and, and audition. So I go to audition. You know, movie people, they're making everything all secret. Steven Spielberg didn't want anybody to know he was doing color purple. So on the outside of the script, it says Moon Song. But I know all the words by heart. <laughs> so when I open the script, I know this is the color purple Jesus. This is the color purple. Yes. So I auditioned for The Color Purple. I can't even believe it. They don't just want me to be the water girl or the best girl. They are asking me, do I want a part in the movie? Oh, that, if that, I'm thinking prayer. Prayer works. Prayer works. But listen to this. Three months pass. Three months is a long time. I auditioned in February. March, April, May comes. I haven't heard anything. So I call Reuben Cannon. I say, Mr. Cannon, I'm sorry, sir. I haven't heard anything. I expected to hear something by now. And Reuben Cannon, African-American man, says to me, you don't call me. I call you. And I didn't call you. Do you understand that I have real actresses who have auditioned for this part? Real actresses. And he tells me who just left his office and I went, well, okay, I'm not getting that part. So I hang up the phone and I start crying. I can't believe that God has played this trick on me. I think, this is a trick. So I decide that this is because the fat has finally caught up with me. The fat has finally caught up with me, and now I must get rid of the fat in two weeks. I am going to go to a fat farm, and I'm going to lose 25 pounds. I'm gonna drink a lot of green juice. I'm gonna have some cleanses and colonics. So I, I, I also was trying to make peace with it. I said, God, I don't understand. I thought it was for me. You ever had that talk with God? I, I, I thought it was for me. I thought it was for me. God, you let me audition with somebody named Harpo. That's my name backwards. Jesus, that was a sign. Wasn't it a sign? And then three months pass, and then, then Reuben Cannon says, real actresses have just left his office. So I start to pray on the track. I'm out on the track at the fat farm, and I am running around at the track at the fat farm. It starts to rain. Y'all know how that is but I don't even care because I am praying to God to help me to let it go. 
Help me let it go because now I've become obsessed with it and it's now controlling my life. I start praying, running around the track. And I keep hearing this noise and I, I can't, there's nobody on the track but me and I'm running around the track. And I look around and it is my thighs rubbing together. It's my thighs. My thighs are rubbing together, causing this thunderous sound. There's nobody on the track. So then I really start to cry. Oh Lord, help me. Help me let it go. Help me let it go. Help me let it go, God. Help me let it go. And you ever did this prayer where you say, okay, Lord, okay, I'm gonna let it go. Then you get up and you go, well, I think I still got a little bit of it. I did, help me let it go, but I am not gonna be able to see the other actress in my part. I won't be able to see it. I won't be able to see Color Purple. Just can't never see it the rest of my life. I won't be able to see it. So then I started, I don't know where it came from. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. I sang and I cried. I sang and I cried and I prayed some more until I could reach the point where not only, not only will I be able to go to the movie, but I can bless the other actress. I can bless her. I can say, I bless you. I bless you. I bless you with this. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my Blessed Savior, I surrender all. And I tell you in my greatest testimony that the instant I laid that thing down, I'm telling you, when I laid it down, when I laid it down and it didn't have me anymore. It had no control over me anymore. I didn't feel anything about it anymore. When I let it go, when I intentionally surrendered it to the power that was greater than I could ever know. The instant that happened, a woman comes running out of the cafeteria screaming, Ofri? Is your name Ofri? For 10 years, nobody could pronounce my name. I said, yeah. She said, somebody's on the telephone for you. He said, his name's Spielberg. I get to the phone. He says, I hear you're at a fat farm. I said, no, sir. This is a health retreat. <laughs> he says, I'd like to see you in my office in California tomorrow. This, this was in Wisconsin, I was. I'd like to see you in my office. And if you lose a pound, you could lose this part. No problem do I have. <laughs> I'll have no problem not losing a pound. So honey, I packed my bags and I stopped at the Dairy Queen. <laughs> I 
I got three scoops just in case I'd lost a half a pound. And the next day, I was in Steven Spielberg's office and he said, you're hired. You're hired. Really special bonus clip that I think you're gonna enjoy. But before that, it's time for the question of the day. I wanna know what was your single biggest takeaway from this video and what are you going to do to take action on it this week? When you write down what day, what time, and what place you're going to take action on something, you have a 91% chance of following through versus just 35% if you got motivated but never wrote down a plan. And when you share your plan and have public accountability, it raises your chances of following through even higher. So that's what I want to do today for you guys. You watch this video. What was your single biggest takeaway and what is your plan to take action on it this week? Let me know. Put it down in the comments below. You build a legacy, not from one thing, but from everything. I remember when I just opened my school, in 2007, I came back and I had the great joy of sitting at Maya Angelou's table. She hadn't been able to attend the opening in South Africa. And I said to her, oh, Maya, the Oprah Winfrey Leadership Academy, that's going to be my greatest legacy. I remember she was standing at the counter making biscuits and she turned, she put the dough down and she looked at me and she said, you have no idea what your legacy will be. <laughs> I said, excuse me? I just opened the school and these girls and it's gonna be, and she said, you have no idea what your legacy will be because your legacy is every life you touch. Every life you touch. That changed me. And it's true, you can't personally stop anybody from walking into a school with an assault rifle, nor can you single-handedly ensure that the rights that your mothers and your grandmothers fought so hard for will be preserved for the daughters that you may someday have. And it'll take more than you alone to pull 40 million Americans out of poverty, but who will you be if you don't care enough to try? And what mountains could we move, I think? What gridlock could we eradicate if we were to join forces and work together in service of something greater than ourselves? You know, my deepest satisfaction and my biggest rewards have come from exactly that. Pick a problem any problem and do something about it because to somebody who's hurting something is everything if you want to change your life for free in the next 30 days check the link right here below me or if you want some success affirmations from oprah check out the video right there next to me i think you'll enjoy them continue to believe and i'll see you there